Hello there and welcome to The Value of Everything. Okay, so we're going to explore American politics. This has dramatic implications regardless of what country you reside in. It also has fairly large political ramifications if you consider that we are sort of in the age of the American empire. So whatever America dictates as law for themselves, if they believe to have a war on terror, a war on drugs, then the majority of the countries will try to mirror those policies to get an advantage on their own trade deals, particularly when it comes to government bond debt issuance. So the USA will have a presidential election scheduled for Tuesday, November the 8th, 2016. We are currently in the stage of the primary elections where both parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, will select their candidates for president election. So from the Republican side, we seem to have maybe one real front runner, which is Donald Trump and say Ted Cruz slightly behind. And from the Democrat side, we have Hillary Clinton as the main candidate, almost like the heir to take the throne and potentially Bernie Sanders following behind her. So I've been trying to do a little bit of a thought experiment in my mind and seeing how potentially things could play out in the future. Now, interestingly, we do have one of the primary candidates who was running for president back in 2008. This, of course, was Hillary Clinton. She was running against Barack Obama and lost by a delegate count of 1,896 to Barack Obama's 2,201. So this is the estimated total delegate count. When we look at delegate counts, there is some kind of proportional representation going on here, but essentially we can determine that Hillary Clinton did lose the primaries. Barack Obama, of course, won on his Yes, We Can Change America pledge, and he did beat Mitt Romney to the presidency. Back in 2008, I guess the people did want change. They didn't want the old establishment presidency candidates like the Clintons or the Bushes coming back to power, and they decided on going forth with a new vision. Now, I guess you can see where I'm coming from now. I am potentially suggesting that Hillary Clinton may not be able to beat Bernie Sanders in the primary election. We have a very important crossroad in the economic cycles, which is kicking in right now, and I do not believe that Barack Obama can hold it back any further. With some degree of probability, an economic crisis will come into the mix between now and November. So there is a famous political phrase, it's the economy stupid. This was James Carville's coined phrase, who was the campaign strategist for Bill Clinton in the 1992 presidential campaign, where Bill Clinton succeeded against George H.W. Bush. How may history repeat itself? So the economy stupid is basically when the state of the economy is dictating what the voters require. So in this situation, if the state of the economy is in a disastrous state, then the people will vote to oust the current government. So this is quite exactly the same in terms of Hillary Clinton because she is just being voted for the primaries. However, she is Secretary of State. Therefore, it could be deemed that under her watch, under the Obama administration, which she is a part of, the economy has fallen further into deprivation. So one interesting thing that you may hear, especially when coming from Bernie Sanders, is that Hillary is part of the establishment. And also her supporters, her backers, do appear to be from the corporations, the lawyer firms, and the financial institutions. So on the backdrop of a disastrous economy, which potentially has been caused by corporate greed, speculative gains without any productive increases, 
So Hillary Clinton could quite easily be implicated in the management of the economy and potentially of how the direction could lead on from that point. Therefore, the people may choose to dissuade away from Hillary Clinton. She may have a lot of backing from the female side of the voting public. However, people may question, well, do we put in somebody who is going to be another puppet for the powerful and the elite? So just cast your minds back in terms of what's happened in recent developments in the UK. Jeremy Corbyn has risen to lead the opposition of the UK government. He is almost deemed as a socialist himself, so it's not too out of the ordinary now in the environment of the political landscape that a socialist could come to power. Now, it's a little bit strange in somewhere which is America, which is all about libertarianism, freedom, capitalism, the sovereignty of the individual rather than the collective of the majority. Yeah, just listen to a few of the interviews of Bernie Sanders. He will not hold back in his attack of the bankers. Now, this is going to be particularly popular with both the left and the right supporters. It is a principle that if people get too powerful, they take too much and they get corrupted then this is too much of a problem and he will always pick to the top 1% or the top of the top 1% and dictate that greed isn't good. This is very popularist to the voting public. Now, on the Republican side, you see that Donald Trump has absolutely blown away all of his Republican challengers on the mandate that he hasn't been funded by the elites. He actually demonstrates in the way that he debates with any of his opponents that he hasn't been funded, that he has actually even funded his opponents. And this gives him plenty of gravitas, especially when it comes to his potential opposition, when it comes for the leadership of the United States. So he does seem to have all the weapons at his disposal when it comes to combating against Hillary Clinton. He has, in fact, been a funder of her in the past, as he claims. So Donald Trump is fairly adept to crushing his Republican opponents based upon their merits of managing an economy. And he's obviously very popular in terms of his opinion on immigration, how we have managed our foreign affairs, how the American state has managed its foreign affairs. If you think of the analogy of papers as a stones, you do have Donald Trump being the scissors who can snip apart at Hillary's position on the state of the government. However, he is in this very problematic situation where he comes against Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders can blunt the scissors in terms of popularist sentiment especially when it comes to not bailing out the banks. Now, as a side analogy to that as well, you could potentially say that Hillary Clinton may be able to cover the rock with her own sense of bureaucracy, how she is more of a states person, and use the rhetoric to cover him up, hide him away, paper over his hard and reckless ways, and really tell the socialist side of the democratic government, which doesn't give them the middle man or the middle person, the Joe Sixpack position that they may really require. So it's potentially is one of these very interesting moments. Now, you do have a situation where you have a Donald Trump who has a very hawkish political stance. He's very pro-military. He's very honest in terms of how he would like to get what he wants. And he does have an exterior in which he looks like he's indifferent or insincere or uncaring to people's needs. So that really can be his unraveling when he would potentially come up against somebody of Bernie Sanders' stature. Particularly when you think of the voting public, they are mainly driven upon emotion and how they can get what they can get in the moment rather than looking too much into the long term. So this is a very interesting landscape. You could almost perceive that there would be this idea where an argument or a debate would come forth. I would say the most difficult landscape would be the banking sector 
on the backdrop of a bad state of the economy. Now, it's interesting to see how Donald Trump will sit with the banking elite. Now, he, he does seem to be fairly okay-ish with banking. The banks have actually bailed him out on a few occasions himself when he has had issues with the financing of his property portfolio. And obviously, a lot of the banks do hire out his floor space at the Trump Towers. So this is going to be interesting. Donald Trump will come forth and say that he is a good businessman. He knows how to manage the economy. He knows how to get things running again. But this could come across as too bigoted. It could come across that he's arrogant. And this could be one of the downfalls, particularly somebody, particularly against somebody who is trying to argue from what may be perceived as all the people. Now, just to have a quick dab at Bernie Sanders, obviously he has got some incredible leanings to a socialist state that is to increase the tax pool, so to tax the rich. This means that there may potentially be more migration of the productive class of the economy of America. They may leave, they may choose to go to a different country which has better tax regulations. That also means that if he's trying to increase the average wages, that may mean that majority of companies will not be able to hire more staff because of the increased amount of expenses which it costs to hire new staff members. It's much easier just to have no minimum wage, therefore anybody can choose to agree to work for any rate. He perceives that college degree education is the most vital way to have a successful economy. However, if you allow everybody to be educated to a college degree, there are some people who essentially are not quite adapt. You are flooding through people into a college state education system, which may not be really useful to somebody who doesn't really need to know too much about theoretical training and may require more practical training in real life, real matters. So apprenticeships or something that can get them into the working force or get them to have life experience is going to be curtailed for a very time consuming and costly education system. This all fits in with a socialist measure to have a Prussian schooling system in which the states will teach you what to think rather than how to think. Let's go back to Donald Trump again. So with Donald Trump, he can seem arrogant, he can seem bigoted. And this does tie into the fact that you are allowing a man who essentially is a power broker, who plays this hardball stance, and he in charge of the largest nuclear arsenal the world has ever seen. This is also on the backdrop of increased amounts of terrorism and a global economy which is getting rougher and rougher. So people are going to say, ah, oh, right, are we going to go for somebody like Donald Trump who is going to ruffle a few feathers and potentially is going to be trying to use this military power bargaining chip to every deal that he ever brokers? Or are we going to have Bernie Sanders who is going to try and break down the elite, give a little bit more to the middle ground and provide potentially more freedom and fairness for all. Now, this is obviously a little bit of a, a dogma in sense of how Bernie Sanders will do this because he's going to increase the tax of the economy. And this essentially does stifle off the productive means of the economy at the same time. One of the interesting things when you hear any socialist who comes to power, the question that he will always be asked is, how do you pay for this? And he will always look at the rich, the wealthy, the elites and say, let's charge a higher taxation for them. Let's go to the bankers and give them a higher ratio of tax for the speculation that they do. Now, the interesting thing and one of the most fundamental things of speculation is that there is a risk and reward. Now, I've made definitely some cases in the past that if you are acquiring loans to use as leverage to increase your asset portfolio and then flip it to buy a larger asset portfolio, 
So like say if you are investing in houses and increasing your portfolio by investing in more houses and using that as collateral to buy more houses, obviously you're not producing anything and you're not increasing anything at all to the productive means of the economy. That is obviously a capital gains tax which doesn't benefit anybody. And if you could highlight that in some way and regulate for it, then that is fantastic. The other side of the scale is obviously let the bubble pop and see where people lie after the speculative gains have collapsed. However, if you do decide to tax on speculation, there is a very important part of the economy where, say, somebody has decided to set up a factory, they think they can produce a better quality good or better quantity of goods with less time, energy and matter, then you do have a problem. You are stifling away the capitalism in the economy and that has this very negative feedback loop. As the capitalism starts to fade away, then more taxes are required for the administration of the government regime. So it does essentially all come down to the economy. This debate will drive down to the economy and a little bit on foreign affairs as well. Now, you would think, okay, when it comes to Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, then there is an easy knock over here. There's an easy push over here. But when it comes to Bernie Sanders and how you can sway popular opinion, then there's a bit of a difficulty here with Donald Trump and how he lies with the bankers and the elite. This obviously will be used for a massive persuasion tool for Bernie Sanders and could quite easily be the downfall of a arrogant, bigoted Donald Trump. Also, another thing to mention is that there is the, the media who are very, very warm to Bernie Sanders, especially when I've, I've seen a few of the interviews online and I've never seen such a warm reception he gets from all of the reporters there. They're almost like saying, mm, yes, I agree. Tell me more. There does appear to be a little bit of bias going on amongst the media. Okay, so back again. Apologies for the change of sound quality. This recording actually has been going over the last three weeks. So as I've been doing this, I've been noticing that the political landscape has been changing. Actually, funny enough, a little bit more in the direction that I'm predicting. So it's kind of interesting and a little bit, tiny bit frustrating because I would like to put out all the comments just before all of these things would have happened. Okay, let's go back into the points I'd like to round off this show with. Now, where I mentioned the political landscape, this is going to be a battleground. And I'm going to just point out the political topics, which you would say that leans to one direction to the other. So this is the battlegrounds where the rhetoric will be fought. I'm just going to try and see in the perspective of a swing voter, which doesn't really have any alliance to one side or the other. And uh, yeah, run through these topics. So Donald Trump, you could potentially see as the better manager of the economy. He is a very successful businessman, so you would choose to have him at the helm in comparison to Bernie Sanders. However, when we look at economic justice, this is fairly similar to what the management of the economy is, but we are looking at the distribution of wealth here. So there is obviously a tax on the level of production and that gets redistributed down to the other levels. Now, with Donald Trump, you may perceive that he may have some leeways and some bargaining with the corporate world, whereas Bernie Sanders will probably not take much in the way of that and will try to, say, fairly justify how the distribution of wealth goes. Now, there's an interesting counter to this in the sense because if you actually do remove too much from the very good productive producing people, say your small businesses that do produce something, then this does become quite problematic for the economy at large. But if Bernie Sanders could delineate the correct people who are using speculative gains to increase their net wealth, then the voter will be on the side of Bernie Sanders. 
Okay, size of the government. Now you definitely could see that Bernie Sanders is going to increase the size of the government. This is not going to be too popular, particularly with the Republican side and anybody who has a libertarian stance. So in this respect, you would definitely say Donald Trump would be there to make the necessary cuts to stop a abnormally large vampirical government getting out of control. Now, here's an interesting topic if it were ever to be raised. Edward Snowden. Now, I would believe that popular opinion is that Edward Snowden is a whistleblower and is not a traitor who deserves to be punished. Obviously, you could see that the voting public is very scared of a Orwellian government who is looking at everybody prying into their lives and are relieved that really good people are turning around, putting their lives at risk to inform the public that the government's power has got out of control. So Donald Trump is very aggressive against Edward Snowden. This would be, I would expect, a massive deterrent for the voting public. They will not like the fact that he will want him arrested and to be penalised for the acts that he perpetrated. On the other side, you do have Bernie Sanders, and he does have a far more soft touch with the subject. He actually mentions a lot in his books that he believes that the government shouldn't be something that the people should be scared of. He believes that there should be less of this prying government that goes in and interferes into people's lives. I would say that this is a very interesting point. So if this was ever to get coverage, then it would be very disastrous for Donald Trump. Okay, now we move on to the military. Now, this is quite an important one because people think in their minds, particularly the, the male block of the voting public, to think to themselves, who has got my back more? Is it Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump? And obviously the one who seems to be on the pro big military stance is Donald Trump. He wants a very big military force as a bargaining chip in terms of his trade deals. So this is a little bit of a splitting topic. On one side, you are going to gain men if you say, yes, I want a big, strong military. And on the other side, you could potentially see that maybe the female side of the voting public and even the recently immigrated side of the population, the voting block there would be dissuaded on increased spending for the military. And this gets us into a little bit of a tricky path. You could say, well, who is going to provide world peace the best? Now, both of them have got a fairly good argument. You could say on one side, Donald Trump wants to be the police force who is protecting everybody's rights. And on the other side, you do have Bernie Sanders, who is the peaceful person who is trying to reduce the size of missile proliferation. OK, let's keep on going through. Now, unions... Donald Trump, is he going to be soft with the unions? Not very much, I would say. So you know, on one side, you could say that maybe the unions are a voting block, but on the public scale at large, I would say particularly Americans, they will be very anti-union. So on the case of a political topic of unions, Donald Trump would win. So on from the unions, we have to look at corporate America which you would say that there's probably more of a corporate issue with America right now rather than a big trade union problem. So who is going to win against defeating corporate America, whereby the shield of corporate laws is protecting too many people? There is laws which are producing coercion and monopolies and to stop the small guys from getting ahead. Now quickly to throw in there, Donald Trump is a bit of a protectionist. He will try to get the corporations to move back all their factory bases to America. This is very pro for him. However, in comparison, Bernie Sanders will try to attack more so of the banking elites and the non-productive side of corporate America. So this is going to be an interesting battleground and you would more so be inclined to say that Bernie Sanders is going to win on this ground. I'm going to extend that a little bit more because I would say that the banking elite or the corporate banking America 
is going to be particularly a very big subject, particularly if this is happening on a backdrop of a bad economy. So if corporate America is pointed to as, say, the banking side of things, then Bernie Sanders is going to get a far stronger foothold. Now we continue on with the economy. Who's going to create more jobs? Now, you would potentially say that Bernie Sanders is going to probably lose on this side because he may say that he's going to create government jobs, but this is a very big, fallacious argument. And you can't really see that Donald Trump is going to overlook this. He is going to annihilate Bernie Sanders when it comes to, say, take out of the productive side of the economy to produce government jobs. So Donald Trump is going to most likely destroy Bernie Sanders on this subject. Um, the next one would be the taxation system. Who is going to create a fair and just and more advantageous taxation system? This is a tricky one because there's two sides to this. There's the one that's going to say Donald Trump is going to be good for businesses. He knows how the system works. He's good economic manager. And then on the other side, you do have Bernie Sanders, who is going to provide more justice in the taxation system. All right. Now we're going to move on from these points and go to immigration. Now, Donald Trump is very outspoken and he is moving the narrative as he goes along with immigration and he seems to be winning and he's actually going against media and winning as well. So you can't really see that Bernie Sanders is going to have too much of a ground to beat Donald Trump. He may actually cause a little bit of division on this subject itself, but I would say overwhelmingly Donald Trump is going to win on the swing voters when it comes to having a strong immigration policy which will push out anybody who is not going to increase to the wealth of America and is going to be very inviting for the ones who will. And um, yeah, let's just round off with a couple of other areas here now. So we do have healthcare, media and energy. I think all of these subjects are fairly neutral in every topic. You could say that on the healthcare side, you do have a lot of very unpopular bills which have been put forward by, say, like Obamacare, and that is potentially going to be repealed by Donald Trump. This is very popular with a lot of people who have found that the costs have increased. Also, that you could say that Bernie Sanders seems like a fair person who is putting forward his arguments to say that this is the richest country in the world. Why shouldn't everybody have the access to good quality care? On breaking down the media, obviously you do have Bernie Sanders as well as Donald Trump being very anti-media in terms of how the corporate world has got its stranglehold on it to create a certain narrative. So I think they're both going to come up on agreements on media. So It's not a battleground that they will fight on very much. And if the media is picking this up, they would obviously not publicize it as much either. Now, um, yeah, I mentioned energy. Energy's a bit of a strange subject at the moment because uh, all commodity prices are in a descending trend. So Donald Trump is more of a person who's going to go out there and try to get access to oil fields and secure Americans' wealth. This is obviously a little bit threatening to world peace. So it's a sort of like, yeah, we're going to go for it. And then at the same time, mm, are you sure you're going to go too far? So on this scale, you can see that Bernie Sanders may seem like a more of a level headed statesman, whereas Donald Trump may seem a little bit more like a saber rattling old man who wants to grab everything for himself. Okay, now we're going to look into flank maneuvers. So this is basically where Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders will use a topic which their opponent is particularly strong on. It looks like they are beating them on the narrative and basically use it for their own means and say, "Okay, well, I'm actually willing to accept this and steal away the middle swing voters. So what would be the winning ticket for Donald Trump? Now, I would say that he would have to take on the banks. He would have to say too big to fail is too much of a problem. And he would have to break up the banks into smaller entities, take on the Fed, review economic policy. Why did they get into that mess? Reinstate Glass-Steagall. This would be a massive, massive, huge win for Donald Trump if he looks like he is going to take on the corporate world. 
Also, if he were to lighten his tone on Edward Snowden and, say, the military takeovers, then he potentially will win a lot of voters who are fairly scared of Donald Trump turning America into some kind of tyranny. If he puts out a point that military is the last resort and negotiations over everything else, then yes, I could see that the votes would lean towards his side. All right, now let's go to Bernie Sanders. Now, if he were to turn around and say, well, this immigration policy is not working for America, we do actually want these people who can produce something of value to this country and we do not want these unskilled immigrants entering into this country, then that would be a winning ticket. Also, if he kept on reiterating that the states should not control the means of production, then that would put him in more of a favourable light. If he turned to books like The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith and said that directors who managed other people's money is a conflict of interest and people should be owning companies and being fairly responsible for corporations rather than being prone to neglect and profusion. If he could raise points about the history of America and its distrust of corporations, how he potentially could look at the Sherman Act and investigate corporate law, which has really improved the big companies and stopped the Joe six-pack on the street. And obviously it's created some kind of financial oligarchy. He almost actually turns around and says, I am pro free market. I want to get the little guy up ahead and I really don't want to have these massive corporations on these hands. I'm a little bit more anti-Walmart and I'm much more mum and pop stores. This would be a major boon for Bernie Sanders. And to tail it off with Bernie Sanders, you could even take it one step further and he could say that he wants a full review of all patent laws and extend the free market to its maximum level, not have all these patent lawyers going around chasing people that are actually not even producing anything, allowing the free market to use knowledge and ideas, exercise it to improve the productive means of the economy. So you can see where I'm coming from here. This actually makes Bernie Sanders look like a real American rather than a real socialist. This is the ultimate reversal of roles, which would flank maneuver the entire voting base. OK, so thank you very much for listening in there. Um, I'd just like to round it off with just a interesting point. You could say that these swing votes that we're getting from one side to the other it's all about freedom, really, and it's all about potentially libertarianism. There was an opportunity with Rand Paul becoming a leader, but potentially he sat on the side of the corporate world so that he could get financial backing to be a proper substantiated leader. However, he slept in bed with the corporate world and that has been his downfall. So in the previous election, the Americans wanted Barack Obama in power, so that could send a message that America was more for world peace and is a mature country which isn't warmongering like the George W. Bush of the administration. Obviously, Barack Obama got voted in twice, but his popularity led him through to the next election and there wasn't really deemed to be a good, viable opponent which could stand up for the freedom of America as much as what Barack Obama could at that time. So as the economy gets worse, you do find out that, that there is more extreme leaders which come to power who have more extreme ideas, but they often do expose a lot of issues with the political system. There is three forms of the power. You do have the president, you do have the Senate, and you do have the people. Each one of those can go corrupt. So you do have the individual who can turn into a tyrannical person. You do have the Senate who can turn into oligarchs who create whatever laws they want to to get their own way. And you do have the people who potentially might not be level thinking, trying to get everything in the moment and be a little bit more on the side of mob mentality. You could almost hope that people are starting to think that this rule of government is not quite working and there must be a better way than this or at least a way in which there could be a mechanism to lower the power of the government or to reduce the size of the government to enable freedom to flourish. Every time you are getting 
an extreme political leader to put out their views. They are putting their views out of freedom and then the voting bloc is swinging from one side to the other to grasp the freedom as much as they can. But then also you do have as well the voting bloc of the mob who wants to get what they can in the moment. And this isn't obviously everybody. If they can exploit the situation and they know they can get away with it, a lot of people will do this because they are not guided by morality. So even if you had Donald Trump, who may be more likely to win at the moment, come to power, then he is obviously going to raise the flag of certain freedoms, but then shut down other things. And then everybody's going to say, right, this is too much. We want to swing it back in the other direction. Now, as this is happening on a worse and worse economic backdrop, you could almost have America falling into the trap of socialism is is that kind of danger that can occur from this ever increasing government that is deficit spending and putting its country in peril. The only real answer is to find a president or somebody who has got the political view to say, right, this is we're getting ourselves out of control here. We need to reduce the size of the government. We need to be more about producing better wealth for our citizens and a better happy life for our citizens and we need to reanalyze everything from scratch again. This is to prevent the speculation, the lobby groups, the mob mentality, the egotistical president. So we can restructure it into a way that everybody doesn't have this mentality to be in it all for themselves and have a long-term view for humanity. So on that note, I shall leave you. Thank you very much for your time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and share as much as you please. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I shall be back again soon.